Their first Hotline Miami game was a fever dream of smeared blood and blurred neon, a surrealist cocktail of music and violence. When I played it in 2012, there was a sense of trespass, of transgression, of danger you got from playing the game. It oozed malice and misanthropy, and it seemed to care about as much for the player as any of the goons it asked them to kill. The game was propelled by its garish colors, soundtrack selection, and tight, rapid-fire levels, but it was that hostile abstraction that glued everything together and turned it into a half-remembered nightmare. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't need to. It operates with a sort of dream logic, where phone calls are enough to make you commit murder, contradictory timelines can coexist, and the world is a series of nightclub floor plans floating in negative space. It is the violent video game id, a manifestation of base impulses for us to simultaneously indulge in and be repulsed by. Hotline Miami 2 is... not that. If Hotline Miami is a magic trick, Hotline Miami 2 is the video where they explain how they did it before making you watch the trick all over again. Yes, it's the same trick, and it's a good trick, but the magic came from not knowing how it was done. Hotline Miami 2 is a haunted house with all the lights on. It's still a series of rooms with scenes of blood and gore, but the sense of fear and danger and confusion are gone. Hotline Miami 2 is the harsh light of day after a party the night before. Fuzzy memories come into sober focus, and now you realize how lame your actions last night really were, no matter how cool they felt at the time. What I'm getting at is that Hotline Miami is a surreal tone piece that worked by keeping players in the dark and unknowing as it guided them through a twisted reflection of their own subconscious. Hotline Miami 2 is a comparatively straightforward alternate history crime drama, whose entire purpose is to tie up all the loose ends in what has effectively become the Hotline Miami universe. And the result is sort of a Guy Ritchie plot by way of Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. And that actually sounds like it could be cool, but it robs the game of the ominous mystery and replaces it with an objective reality of plot threads to untangle. So in place of a vaguely malevolent dream space, we now have lore! So much lore! In Hotline Miami 1, did you want to know who the bearded guy was who seemed to work in all those stores? Well, now you can! Did it bug you that there were two conflicting timelines in Hotline Miami? Because now we just have a single canonical timeline. Ever wonder what happened to the Russian mob after Jacket killed hundreds of their lot? Ever wonder what a 50 Blessings recruiting station looks like? Ever wonder what that picture was at the end of Hotline Miami? What's Richter's backstory? If the gang leader at the end of the first game had kids, how would they take his death? Did Jacket go to jail for the murders, or did he get away? This game answers all of those needless questions and more by setting up a timeline of events that span before and after Hotline Miami. To do this, the game has you playing 13 separate characters across 9 separate storylines that intersect and weave in and out of not only each other, but also Hotline Miami. It's an overwhelming number of pixelated bodies and voiceless faces to keep track of, and it's made worse by the confusing, non-linear nature in which we are forced to experience them. I'd say that choreographing a plot this complicated is impressive, except, well, it's not hard when your plot is mostly just people showing up places to kill other people, often for almost no reason. With character arcs and motivations mostly out of the way, it's just a list of people being at places at times, and then some death happens. Still, it's a web of more than ten characters, each moving around and interacting with each other, so not only is there lore, but there's lots of lore. Complicated lore. The kind it takes multiple playthroughs and maybe a visit or two to a fan wiki to really figure out. Which wouldn't be bad if all that lore gave us some deep insights into some of those many characters, but it's mostly just backfilling the alternate history stuff. This alternate history thing was lightly touched on in Hotline Miami, what with the secret 50 blessings ending, and the Russian text above the English text in the title, and the fact that you were killing tons of Russian mobsters. And even in Hotline Miami 2, you only get fragments of the timeline told in terse cutscenes before and after murder sprees. But at some point in the mid-80s, there was a war between the United States and Russia, and Hawaii was somehow a major front in that war. America lost on that front, and then San Francisco was nuked, and America ended up being basically a Russian protectorate. And it's implied that's what pushed Jacket from the first game over the edge, as he was stationed in Hawaii with Beard, and after they lost Hawaii, Beard died in San Francisco. After San Francisco got nuked, the 50 Blessings started as basically an American nationalist movement rebelling against Russian rule by getting randos to kill Russian mafiosos who had apparently moved into Miami by the hundreds? This story still doesn't really make any sense, but anyway, then Hotline Miami happens. Then there are bits after Hotline Miami that mostly explore how Jacket influenced the lives of some vigilantes and how the Russian mob slowly clawed its way back despite all the people it lost. 
Then the world ends when American nationals kill high-ranking Russian and American officials and Russia launches the nukes and the game ends with a montage of characters we've barely gotten to know all getting turned to dust. The end. And for a story explaining why a series of video game levels exist, it's fine. Functional. It takes the universe and expands it and gives it the where and when and how of Hotline Miami and what happened afterwards. I just didn't get anything out of it. It didn't use its alternate history to comment on or examine actual history or make parallels to the modern day. If anything, the Nationals fighting Russian invasion thing is a little awkward now where it wasn't in 2012. Also, I don't feel like I really appreciate Hotline Miami 1 anymore because of this. If anything, I'm a little uncomfortable with how it reframes Jacket's experiences in Hotline Miami. Outside of context from the second game, Hotline Miami is just a surreal little title. But with Hotline Miami 2 giving it context and an objective reality to ground it, all the weirdness that plays out in the first game, from seeing dead people, to beard working at every store, to murdering people over phone calls, seems to imply a degree of mental instability on Jacket's part, likely stemming from PTSD from his war days, and that's the kind of deeper understanding that actually kind of makes the first game more uncomfortable and less enjoyable. Also uncomfortable? The opening scene where sexual assault is implied, but it's okay because they were just filming a movie, inside of a movie, inside of a game. They toy with this metatextual concept a bit. The pause menu is a nice touch. But this faux assault is the only time it really comes up, and I suspect it only comes up to get away with including the faux assault. Denaton knew it didn't really add anything, and it wasn't core to the story or the mythos, so they made it skippable, but it's still there, an indulgence on the part of the developers. And that's how most of the game feels. Indulgent. It's like they did to Hotline Miami what Peter Jackson did to The Hobbit. It's about three hours longer than it needs to be, and it tries to turn a small tone piece into this epic about violence, nationalism, and the end of the world, and it just doesn't earn any of that because the whole thing is told in half-paragraph vignettes in between hour-long murder sprees. And that self-indulgent bigness comes across not just in the scope of the story, but the size of the levels. Hotline Miami levels were short, mostly. But Hotline Miami 2's levels are sprawling affairs with multiple segments all loaded with dangerously long hallways and open spaces. You will die from bullets fired by goons off-screen. A lot. <laughs> This also happened in Hotline Miami, but the number of levels with wide open floor plans and enemies far from you was comparatively rare. In contrast, the first level of the game has a long hallway where this happens, and the second level has a big department store's open layout. Almost every level feels one stage too long and full of too many open areas, but if you really want to see this idea of bigger and badder distilled, look at the conclusions of the two games. In Hotline Miami, the final boss has three lone guards, then the boss itself pretty straightforward. Hotline Miami 2's climactic fight is a three-stage epic battle across an entire mansion. The denouement in Hotline Miami is three brief levels, and then a fourth that's actually all walking and talking. Hotline Miami 2's is a series of hallucinated boss fights in a drug-induced stupor. But the game also feels indulgent because, while they expanded on the game in ways no one had ever really asked for, they never fixed core issues from the first game. Door physics remain really awkward. The AI seems really unpredictable. Sometimes they'll hear gunshots and sometimes they won't. They still don't register that their partner has been stabbed even if they walk over the body. Human and more often dogs will have their AI break and cause them to just spin in a circle for all time. Picking up weapons remains awkward when there's a pile of them because you'd never know which one you're actually going to put in your hands when you right click. And the sprites are so low res that it's hard to discern between, say, a cop's gun and a cop's baton in the heat of the moment. Those low-res sprites also hurt the game on the many dark levels that take already lo-fi graphics and muddy them up with color changes or dim lighting. Still, the shell of Hotline Miami is there, and when it clicks, it really clicks. Being able to know a level and the enemy's weapons and patterns and the timing and the AI algorithms well enough to rapidly clear out even a quarter or half of the stage is really exhilarating. It's just that so often it's easier to cheese the game, to play a glorified peekaboo with the enemies. <laughs> Because the levels are so large, they take a long time to clear, so death becomes a bigger punishment than it used to be. And because the levels are so full of open spaces, death from off-screen is likely forcing you to move from cover to cover and sweep the camera around before moving. These changes combine to promote a more cautious, slower style of play through most of the game. Instead of feeling like you're just 30 seconds of frantic not screwing up away from beating each scene, you instead feel like you're two or five minutes of cautious killing and door exploits from winning. That saps the adrenaline that fueled the trance-like sense the first game had, and amplifies the frustration with the game's glitchy mechanics. 
At the end of the day, Hotline Miami 2 feels like a proper video game industry sequel. It is more of the same, done up bigger and badder. And if you really just want more of the ultraviolence set against some really great music, it definitely provides that. <laughs> But all the magic is gone. Hotline Miami worked because of what wasn't said. It stoically asked the player to commit horrific acts and then let them project on those acts any meaning they wanted. I looked at a canvas where you could only paint with violence, felt ill at ease, and then praised Hotline Miami for making me uncomfortable. Somehow I arrived at the idea that the reasonless, purposeless murder was somehow meaningful or profound expressly because of its lack of reason or purpose. Hotline Miami 2 goes out of its way to give context and meanings to the killing on screen. Yet, somehow they managed to be even more pointless. In letting us peek behind the curtain and learn about the game's universe, they gave away the trick. And the game stopped being about existential dread and introspection, and instead became a flaccidly told grindhouse story, told to us by a man in a nightclub wearing a pastel suit.